Good morning, everybody. People often ask me, you know, what do you look for in a script? And I say, basically, you know, is it a good story? Does, if it's a comedy, does it make you laugh? Is it a Twitter, does it make you turn the pages? Um, really, it's just a narrative like any other narrative. And uh, if it holds your attention and moves you, that's what you want. My phone rang, and it was Steven Spielberg, and I thought it was a friend playing a joke, obviously. And he said, look, I really, you know, we haven't worked together in a long time. I really like your work. Could you please read this? And... I think there's a really great movie in here and I think you can make it. And when I took the job, I always said, if I can make this movie a John Hughes sort of say anything, teen angst romance movie and combine that with a thriller, then that's something I hadn't seen before. So it was an interesting exercise as a director to sort of blend those genres. DJ wanted to make like a John Cusack thriller. And I love doing comedy. And, and DJ likes throwing comedy into the mix. You want to do this genre jump in type of film. The thriller, the romance, the comedy, the drama, the whole scenario that is teenage life. I'm not a stalker. These are just simple observations. Natural side effects of chronic boredom. Basically, this is a movie about, you know, people watching other people while we're watching them. And I think that more so than ever, we are a culture of voyeurs. We like to call it people watching, but it really is just spying. This movie particularly felt like a gift because I was able to relate to Kale's character via Shia and sort of be that voyeur and look over his shoulder and kind of feel guilty when he feels guilty and you know sort of feel aroused when he feels aroused or be scared when he's scared. When Steven Spielberg called me he said look it's sort of that voyeuristic idea but what's the difference between being a voyeur now or a voyeur then or a voyeur five years ago or even a voyeur two years ago. Some of my marching orders as the writer was to to really explore ways in this 21st century age we live in as to how do you possibly cut a person off from the world. Even though you're confined to the four walls of your house, you still have all sorts of things to entertain yourself. She took my Xbox and my iTunes are gone and I can't go anywhere. Technology allowed us to open up the movie now too in a very interesting way. These digital cameras with 700 millimeter lens, you know, when you go into the digital zoom, you can zoom right into your neighbor's like nostrils. So this generation of film goers is so used to this voyeuristic aspect in their life because they're all on the computers and they're all sort of doing things in private and doing things they shouldn't be doing. Why does he want his privacy? I mean, he's hiding something. We know that. Yeah, definitely. But he's right. We're the ones spying. As a filmmaker, you're constantly listening to people's conversations. You're in the supermarket in line studying the cashier. I, at least I am anyway. And, and you're in your own private sort of little world of voyeuristic experiences because you're trying to think, how can I become a better filmmaker so that I can convey things to the, the mass audience? I've never met a person who understands human behavior and interaction more than DJ. DJ's directing the movie, but he's creating this, this vibe where this culture of people who are all involved and everyone's opinion means something. What were you going to say? What was your suggestion? I tried to say it doesn't matter who walks in front of him. You know, they're valuable to the movie he's making. And, uh, you know, that makes everybody feel like this is a safe place to be doing our work, which is a great thing when you want to be creative. It always is a collaboration, and it's inspiring people to do their job in, in the best way that they can. And you want to do what he wants you to do because he's a good person, and, and he works hard, and he's tireless, and I, I just think he's really, really great. It's just conducive and everyone eggs you on. And you just feel that, you know? You feel like we're, we're all on the same team. That's good, that's good. <laughs> wow. Nice. Is he right? <laughs> he was moving. Smoking. Good job, Shia. He's just able to talk to actors, especially watching him talk to Shia, whose role is so much more demanding than my role. You know, you hear you, you, your mom's gonna be Carrie Ann Moss. It's like this badass feeling, like, Carrie Ann Moss is my mom, bro. Chill out, you know? You know, who's playing my, Carrie Ann Moss? Shy is, I think, 18 or 19, and he's doing another movie right after this. And I remember those days of just working, working, working. And when you have a family, it's totally, totally different. And so I'm sort of reevaluating for myself what my career looks like now that I'm in this, in a different phase of my life. And then to see her in mommy mode, such a weird segue. And she was in mommy mode because she had kids on set, so she was thoroughly in that. <laughs> I thought you heard me. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I didn't hear you like a ninja. I would riff around like she's like a ninja. And you just say, oh, go say it. Oh, oh, riff, riff, riff. I like to give my actor those freedoms to sort of, if they fail, they fail. And we go back and we do another take. But I like to push them because it's no fun to just sit there and do the same take after take after take. And David Morris is wonderful because he'll say, did you print that one? Did you like it? And I would say, yes. He said, I'm going to give you something different here. You okay? Can you do one more? Oh, yeah. yeah. And action. <laughs> David Morse is just first choice because he's not only charming, sophisticated, and a, and a gifted actor, but he also can be incredibly chilling and creepy and, and enjoy doing it. And now we gotta bring your mom over here so you can slit her throat. So it sounds good. And also bring something to the character that's not so cliche. I mean, David builds this whole backstory and really understands Turner and ultimately knows him better than anybody else and believes himself to be a great person and a good guy who just has some problems. It can be really scary, and especially the suspense moments, like working with David Morris, is, is terrifying. The scene in the car is absolutely terrifying. That was David's first day of shooting in the movie. Here we are taking this like four and a half page scene of dialogue and throwing it down like, hey, welcome to Disturbia, here we go, action. Uh, and in the very first take, it was just, it was so clear to me that this guy was such a gifted guy, actor and such a talented actor that it just made me feel great knowing that the rest of the movie was going to be cake. Hi, I'm Robert Turner. I live behind you. That was probably one of my favorite scenes to work on. Working with David, I think, was probably the best part of working on the film. I think I really learned a lot from him. Whether he's a good guy, a bad guy, or whoever he's portraying, and he has to make it his reality, and he has to understand the character. And it was very interesting because on the set, he wasn't really friendly with Shia, you know, because he was portraying Kale, and Kale was the character that was sort of screwing up Turner's life at this moment. Yeah, it was a wild scene. You know, David wouldn't talk to me, period. Just some, he's a method actor. And so David was really, really cold to Shia. I mean, intentionally so, because I don't think he ever wanted to really like Shia because it would hurt the character relationship that they developed. Ready and action! And as the film progressed and the fight scenes built and they got very close and started physically like killing each other, they, they really loved each other. They were really, had really great respect, but it was David's way of saying like, I don't like you. I didn't know much about Shia. I'd seen him in a couple things, but man, am I impressed with him now. To see it all in somebody as young as he is, to have those skills, the awareness, and that, that uh, real sense of truth, and got lots of energy. You know, he's, uh, he's the real deal. So it's, it's, it's nice to be around that. Jesus. Oh, what? She just saw me again. She no, saw me. No, yes, no, I no, promise. No, no, no. What happened to Angle from the... Oh, my God. Cut. Cut. <laughs> Carl's laughing at his own writing, so don't even worry. <laughs> a lot of Carl's and Chris's dialogue is in the movie, but it's sort of been Shia eyes. We improv a lot. DJ let us, you know, have a lot of freedom. And with Aaron, we would do the same thing. And I think Aaron's gift is that he organically oh. feels the senses and feels the situation, and it becomes funny because he's just a funny person. I like the chocolate egg better. <laughs> Dancing, dancing, and action! Right before we were gonna shoot, someone from props or set dressing will come up and be like, so DJ said I should give you these. And like in that scene, it was like a jar of macadamia nuts. <laughs> and DJ comes over and he goes, I just thought you would show up with, um, you know, with macadamia nuts. And you just go, what do you do with the jar of macadamia nuts? And I'm like, I have no idea. We'll just put it in the scene and see what happens. How you doing? Have you bathed? Macadamia of course. Nuts? Oh. That's why you brought me some macadamia nuts? Are you kidding me? I'm not even sure if it's funny or not, but it's it seemed to fit perfectly. I think Disturbia has a lot of funny things in it. I don't want to say by accident, but just sort of by the design and the situations that are created. We were never going like, oh, let's do it again. That would be funny. It was just sort of the circumstances that were created and sort of the organic situations between Ronnie and Kale and some of the other stuff. No. no. It's important to take some breaks and actually say, hey, you know, we're laughing along with you here and we're just kind of giving you a little wink just to go along with us and, and to keep going for the ride that we're taking you on. I got you now, Green One! You better not be listening! Big tactical error, my friend. Huge! Whether it's the, the comedic situations that, that arise or the thriller aspect, you're spending time with a character that you really like and you really understand. If you don't care about the person or the character who's going through this, 
then none of it is scary and none of it is funny. There's nothing more important than character as far as the director is concerned. The players are character driven, the story is character driven, and designing a room for a particular character in, in our story, this room should have a, a certain character. Is this your room? Just so you know, it's a little messy, okay? A little? Scenery is like a crutch. When you have scenery to play with, then it becomes beyond performance, just you can make it very real. And I'll never forget the production designer and I both smoked a cigar in his dad's office on stage, just so when Kale would open that door, he would get the sense that his dad was a writer, and that was an old writer's desk and an old typewriter. You have to figure out the colors, the textures, the architecture, and uh, the most important thing for me is the lighting, and the lighting is usually uh, a combination of lamps in a room and what light comes in through a window. There's nothing more important than windows in this movie as far as I'm concerned because people are inside them looking out. They are looking out into other windows. We look closely trying to figure out what's going on inside them. Damn. Uh-huh. Right. Whoa. You see what I'm saying? I convinced the studio that this sort of Pasadena craftsman look would be a great house for Kale because they're very, very warm in the day and they receive light in a very warm way. So if you want the movie to be intimate and warm and fun, the house would work very well that way. They're also very, very dark and shaded. And they're almost like this big eyebrow because of the, the hooded porch front that comes out. And so I always felt like Kale, that's Kale's eyebrow. That house is a big eye eyebrow. And you can look out from the dark and see the light, which is something symbolically I wanted Shia and the character of Kale to do was sort of to look out for that light because there's so much darkness inside. So there was a nice cinematic metaphor there. There was a lot of action in this and it goes on and on and on. And, it, and, you know, considering that it really is happening within one location, supposedly, you can't believe how much time and distance you cover. You know, we're out on location in Whittier at the beginning of the movie, and I'm chasing Shy out to his backyard, and, and we're having a, a fight out there. And then two months later, we're doing another part of the fight, the beginning of the fight inside the house. come to the location, it's up to me to make what the director's vision is become a reality safe, obviously, that's first and foremost, and the actors, obviously, they have to feel very comfortable doing what they do. When you bring this over, if you can bring it on, because you don't want to go right to the neck, if you can bring it on, to like here, then as you drag it up, then he can meet you and, and protect him. So that way it gives you an opportunity, uh, Shy, to know, feel okay, like that. The, the scary part was probably the bat going through the door. Running across the roof is running across the roof at the end of the day. But a bat coming right by my face, and I was like, what, what do you mean? Like, wood is gonna splinter right by my eyes? There's a point where I have to say enough is enough because I don't ever want to put them in a situation where they can uh, get injured or harmed. So that's when we have stunt doubles come in. We're going with the stunt doubles on the techno frame. Action! This was a really good exercise for me as a director to, to say like, yes, and, and it's, it's a movie that celebrates your voyeuristic gift, I guess, or you're, well, you're allowed to be a voyeur. For me, I always thought, God, if I got a chance to be a voyeur as a filmmaker, it would be fun, and Disturbia kind of provided that for me. Cut. Cut. All right, thank you.